No. Good evening. Welcome to the Salem Area Mass Transit District's Board of Directors virtual meeting for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. Uh, it's a little after 6.30 p.m. and we'll I'll call the meeting to order. Um, the first item is uh, Ms. Galeazzi, could you please note the attendance? And we have a quorum? Yeah. Excellent. So with a quorum, uh, we'll go ahead and proceed with business. The first item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, General Manager Pollock, would you lead us in that? Can you join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which to stand, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And as always, uh, we start our meetings with a safety moment. Thank you. So. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the news that uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, positive tests and hospitalizations are on the rise uh, in Oregon and in Marion and Polk County. Uh, so uh, the safety message for today is please adhere to the governor's three W's of wash your hands, wear your mask uh, to help uh, minimize the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and also earlier this week, the governor did come up with some revised guidance. I just wanna let the board know uh, that uh, uh, I issued uh, update memo number 40 today, uh, announcing the revised guidance uh, and changes in practices within the district. Uh, primarily the impacts of the district is the uh, wearing of masks inside, uh, even if you're able to maintain that six foot of distance. Uh, and so that is now in effect, as well as the encouragement of wearing masks uh, as opposed to shields, even though uh, shields are still authorized, we highly recommend wearing masks when as much as possible. So that concludes my safety message. Thank you, General Manager. Uh, next are announcements, and I'll just make a, a couple here. Um, the first is I'd like to welcome our newest uh, director, Director uh, Maria Inojos Presi. So um, welcome as the newest board member. Um, actually, as the newest board member, uh, we're experiencing a little bit of history. Um, so with uh, Director Inojos Pressy's uh, joining the board, uh, tonight marks uh, the first time that Chariots or the Salem Area Mass Transit District has ever had a majority female board of directors. So, <laughs> So I, I'd just like to share a little bit of history here. Um, so Chariots has been around for 41 years, and uh, over the years there have been periods of time where there have been up to three female members on the board, but this is the first time that of uh, a seven-person board we've had four, which is of course a majority. Uh, so that's very exciting for Chariots and for the community. Um, I also just wanted to plug that over the years there's been 14 female board members that have served and they provided over 67 years of service, or they provided over 67 cumulative years of service. And the first uh, female director to serve was Marsha Kelly, um, who was just recently on the board. Um, she served, um, she's also the longest serving board member, I should also say that. Um, she served uh, for 30 years on the board and from 1989 to 2019. So congratulations. And uh, with that, I'd also like to um, transition to a slight change in the agenda. Um, so the, uh, the board met in executive session uh, doing a consideration of a labor negotiation. And so I'd like to move um, an item to G5 for the board to take action on that uh, lab item of labor negotiation. And um, with that, we can roll right along into the presentation for the Attitude and Awareness Survey results. Thanks, I'd like to ask our Director of Communication, Patricia Feeney, to present the uh, report. Thank you. Good evening, President Davidson, directors, and General Manager Pollock. Welcome to the highly anticipated presentation of the Attitude and Awareness Survey results. Our last survey was conducted in 2017 
We were right in the middle of beginning a rebranding. We were expecting new buses, but they hadn't rolled in yet. We were going to be implementing new service, including Saturday service. It still had not occurred. And we were on the brink of getting an influx of a lot of money from both the state and the federal government. This survey of 2020 will be serving as our baseline for comparison for future attitude and awareness studies. A quick overview. This survey was conducted in February, March, and April of 2020. 400 people were sampled in Marion and Polk counties. The survey was conducted by the Oregon-based MDC Research. Next slide, Ross. There are several tech takeaways, but the key ones I wanted to touch on, more than 90% agree chariots is a valuable resource for the community. Most, more than 70%, are aware of an available public transit system, and more than 50% were able to name chariots without any prompting. Hispanic households are significantly less likely to report familiarity. Half of those sampled have never used public transportation at all, and most say they never or very infrequently use chariots. Salem businesses in the Capitol Mall area employees report higher overall ratings. Next slide. Our audience for this survey were the downtown Salem businesses, government workers in the Capitol Mall area, college and university students, and Latino households. Next slide. Our first audience is the business and Capitol Mall area. A few takeaways. The satisfaction rating overall was 55%. The website traffic was 76%. And 80% agree with this statement, chariots is a valuable resource for my community. Next slide. Our second audience were area students. Conversely, they gave us a 37% satisfaction rating, but 74% do use the website for their trip planning, and 90% agree with the statement that chariots is a valuable resource for our community. Next slide. Our third audience were Hispanic households. What's different from our 2017 survey is that we didn't specifically target this population in our community, but it is important for our, our outreach efforts and our planning efforts going forward. So we wanted to make sure that we included them in this survey. 43% did not know how to rate chariots, but 45% suggested more advertising, which is a really good piece of information for us as we go forward. But even though there was a lack of familiarity, 95% agreed, again, with the statement that chariots is a valuable resource for our community. Of note, the use of personal vehicles was high among all of the audience. Business and capital, 93%. Students, 85%. Hispanic households, 96%. Our next slide. As you will see in the next slide, while 55% of the sample believe public transportation is important to some degree, a little more than a quarter believe it is extremely unimportant. The detractor is more likely to be 55 or older, male, primarily use their vehicle, have an income of 75,000 or more, and obtain community news from traditional media sources. Next slide, Ross. We also wanted to include questions this time specifically about our other, um, our other services, so regional, Lyft, our shop and ride, but this time we also included trip choice, which we had in the past. The familiarity was low among all of our services with trip choice being the lowest. One of the reasons I wanted to include Trip Choice in this survey is that that program moved into the communication division in July of 2019. To prevent a cohesive story, I thought it was important that we would have Trip Choice in the survey. We are now looking at, is it the familiarity of the Trip Choice name? Does it accurately, accurately reflect the programs that they develop and promote? Those are all things we'll be looking um, as we go into our planning for the next year. Our next slide. Because the second wave of our survey occurred into the uh, pandemic, 
we regrouped with our surveyors and decided that we needed to put some questions in there, actually more of qualifiers in there. For example, before COVID pandemic, were you employed? Before COVID pandemic, were you a student? So again, it was clarifiers, but we did want, want to do one open-ended question, and that was how chariots should deal with COVID-19. Four out of 10 or 38% didn't know what to do. 21% recommended limiting the number of passengers and social distancing, which we're doing. 17% require masks and gloves. Again, that is all part of our protocol. And 4% recommended a shutdown, which we fortunately have not had to do except for that brief period earlier in the year. Our next slide. As the promotional arm of the district, our team puts a lot of time and resources into paid media, earned media, social media, and outreach. For this survey, I wanted to pose the question, where do people go for their news and information? On this final slide, you'll see that 56% rely on television, which for us in Salem, we're at a bit of a disadvantage because as you know, we do not have a local broadcast TV station. But 54% use Google slash internet, 46% use social media, 42% newspaper, 35% smartphone news app, and 34% use radio. In the past, we have invested significantly in radio advertising. And while it is still a value added venue, particularly with our Latino stations in Dallas and Woodburn, we will be looking at the return on our investment with some of the other outlets that we have used as part of our marketing outreach in the past. With that brief overview, I will entertain any questions. Are there any questions? Director Carney. Sorry, I see that my hand is blurred out. So thank you for recognizing that, <laughs> President Davidson. Um, just an observation, this uh, uh, has a nexus to the conversation we had prior to this in our work session about vehicle purchasing. I noticed in the student responses in particular um, that students noted that they did not feel safe riding chariots. And I'm wondering where or how does the board have a role in discussion about whether or not we tint our windows on the bus? Because I feel like um, adding visibility to that scenario, sort of daylighting it, if you will, um, literally, uh, maybe could change the perception of the bus being something that is, um, you know, a black box, if you will. Just a just a thought in passing. Any other comments or questions? I do have one more. Please. Um, and that is just uh, I can appreciate the, the, the sort of we we had a a statistic that illustrated you know we said like m the people that tended to you know the 25 percent of respondents that indicated this is not a value add to my community were older and white and affluent and they were car driving males um and i can appreciate that but i would i would be interested in knowing what the actual number was um because i assume that we didn't ask you know, that 25% of our sample was not older, white, affluent, car driving males. Um, and so I kind of, I want to dig into that data a little bit because um, if it was 25% of our overall sample in the survey, then we, we needed to look at who we were surveying because that's not one in four members of our, of our community, of our service area. Um, so just if we could have a little bit more statistics, I, I appreciate knowing that that is who answered that way, um, but I want uh, just a little bit more information when I see something like that. President Davidson, uh, Director Carney, uh, what I will do is share the full report with you. There is actually a very deep data dive at the end of the report provided by MDC 
And if that probably will satisfy um, the points that you just raised, I will get that out to you tomorrow. Thank you so much. And I'm sure it will, yeah. Director Wynn. Thank you, President Davidson. My question is, what? how often do we do the survey? And um, what? How, how is this information applied? Uh, President Davidson, um, Director Wynn, we, uh, the first survey we did, or at least on my watch, and Alan probably has more history than I do, was 2017. But again, so many dramatic changes have occurred in the last three years that we needed a better baseline to move forward. Attitude and awareness surveys can be done yearly. They can be done every two years, every three years. That's one of the things that we need to establish is how often we are going to do them. I think the next survey is gonna look extraordinarily different given the COVID um, pandemic and the recovery time that it's going to take. So I, I will be curious uh, to see what a survey uh, results will look like in two or three years. For us, it's our, our it, um, it be incorporated in our planning for our marketing. So for example, when we find out that uh, surveys response indicates that the Latino population recommends more advertising. That tells us we need to focus there. When we have our services coming out with such low familiarity, again, that's where we need to be focusing a little more of our muscle. So for us, this is a planning tool. But if I could add on to that. So so prior to 2017, there, there wasn't necessarily, we, we did it, but there wasn't a kind of a, set schedule. I think our intent now is uh, with the communication team we have is to do it every other year. So this year we survey, we get the results, we do some changes, and then the following year we, we measure again to see if the changes have, have taken. So every the plan is every other year. Director Bush. I was just curious as to um, what were the factors or the reasons for choosing these three particular audiences? Um, are, were they the same ones in 17? Um, does the results of this survey in, dictate which audiences you choose next time? The, actually, um, Director Bush, it was much broader we just collapsed those into those categories for our presentation, but we actually looked at um, area colleges and universities, city, county government employees, state employees in the Capitol Mall area, downtown Salem employers, the Latino community and families. And so some of these we were able to group together and that's why it was just easier for presentation, but the scope of work was actually much broader. Okay, it sounds like you were focusing more in, on the um, urban growth better, our district specifically. Did you take into account the, the regional services or um, even Kaiser residents or a state and or? We did, we actually, the, when I say the university students, we also spoke with students that were at Western Oregon University. So when I say the local area colleges, Okay. Not, it's not just Willamette, it's not just Chemeketa. It is outside of the immediate Salem area. Okay. And I, I do recognize that our area, um, Salem Kaiser School District, a lot of folks ride the bus, not now, but they did. And that would be a, a, another category that would be effective for us. Thank you. Director Wynn. Great, thank you. I, I just wanna, um, having, come from market research as a background. It's really heavy work and I really appreciate all the um, uh, oversampling that you've chosen to do with certain demographics and ensure that all the voices are heard. So that way, really the best way that we can provide the best user experience is by listening first. So having heard uh, general manager Alan, uh, Pollock's um, uh, say that we first listen before we try to respond to the needs is really heartening and uh, shows yet again um, that your uh, steadfast, steadfast leadership, um, servant leadership style is very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
I'll just make one comment. I, I, I thought it was really interesting for the Hispanic households that the top ranked sources for chariots trip planning, 54% were friend and family. And I, I would love to learn more on why that is, whether or not that's a, a technological gap, like there's a digital um, reach is forcing people to do that, or if that's just viewed as a, a, a genuinely trusted source that is reliable. Um, I'm Maybe I'm speaking or revealing too much about my own personal background, but I don't think I would trust my father with um, bus directions. So mm -hmm. it, it may simply be a, a, a different culture as well. So, um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our agenda is public comment. Uh, Ms. Kaliazzi, did we receive any uh, submitted, no public comment? And no public members of the public here. Any members of the public on the video feed that would like to comment? I am not seeing any. Okay. Um, the next on the agenda is the consent calendar. So if everyone's comfortable with the items on the consent calendar, uh, could somebody please make a motion? Director Krebs. I move that we approve the consent calendar. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Director Bush. Okay, Director Bush is seconded. Second yes. Thank you. Uh, motion second. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Okay, Ms. Kaliazzi, could you do a roll call vote? Director Krebs. Aye. President Davidson. Aye. Director Nguyen. Aye. Director Kearney. Aye. Director Richards. Aye. Director Bush. Aye. Director Eno Sopressi. Aye. You know, <laughs> okay, that's passed. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to the action items portion of our agenda, ad agenda or item G. Um, the first is the approval of the city of Woodburn's uh, proposal and general manager Pollock. I'll ask uh, Director Dickey to please present the report. Good evening, President Davidson, members of the board. Tonight we have an opportunity to bring to you a project that is to be funded by a brand new program uh, that is a joint op uh, operation between the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs and the Oregon Department of Transportation. In autumn of 2019, the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs invited the Oregon Department of Transportation's Public Transportation Division to develop and implement the Rural Veterans Healthcare Transportation or, or, or RVHT grant program. This program was created by a one-time allocation of $500,000 of Oregon De Department of Veterans Affairs uh, to the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs from Oregon Lottery Dollars for the purpose of serving transit-related healthcare needs of veterans living in specific rural areas. Uh, the initial RBHT solicitation was released April 10th of this year. Applications were due May 18th for projects beginning on August 1st. At the same time, many of Oregon's eligible STF agencies were suspending service, heavily engaged in COVID-19 response or both. And as a result, uh, pandemic-related precautions were also uh, an early challenge to assembling STF committees. Perhaps as a direct result of these factors, the proposals received by the Public Transit Division were insufficient toward the entire uh, resource. Additionally, after the first funding cycle, ODOT Public Transit Division was advised that the Oregon Lottery had been materially impacted by the closure of businesses where Kino and video gaming systems were prevalent. Because of this, Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs asked the Public Transit Division to limit 
the initial RVHT awards to 90% of the allocation, no more than 450,000. On July 15th, 2020, the Oregon Department or Oregon Transportation Commission approved the first seven awards for a distribution, total distribution of 230,000. The round two solicitation seeks to award the remaining 220,000 to seven, uh, 220,000 for seven months of project delivery, December 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. Applications for this round of funding were due by 5 p.m. on September 18th. And the notice for this funding was sent out on August 18th. So it was a very short window of, of application uh, period for uh, applicants. It is the Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs intent for the RVHT to continue the good work started by Oregon's successful implementation of the federally funded Rural Veterans Transportation Program. Accordingly, two RVHT applications are invited from STF agencies in areas that are not already receiving services from Rural Veterans Transportation Grant Pro Award. So a little background on that is there, there are different classifications of rural areas uh, for transportation programs that the Veterans Affairs oversee. Very, very rural programs uh, in a lot of our Eastern Oregon areas and some of the, the Southwest are, are already served by programs administered by the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs. On the contrary side of that is services within urban areas is already provided through uh, programs that fund uh, transportation services that are already in existence that allow the veterans to take advantage of those services to access medical services. So there has been a gap in between though of veterans who live in the other rural areas that are outside of services provided by urban providers and yet don't qualify by definition for the rural veterans program that is administered by the Veterans Administration. The Santa Maria Mass Transit District is the STF agency for Marion and Polk counties. As a result, the district is responsible to apply for funds for the RVHT grant program uh, for any agency in Marion or Polk counties that desires to use these funds to support veterans health care transportation. Uh, that is our role as the STF agency and this is uh, the method at which the uh, two agencies agreed would be appropriate for allocating these, uh, the distribution of these funds. Uh, the city of Woodburn expressed an interest shortly after the August 18th notice of funding availability. Staff also notified Polk County and city of Paul City of the opportunity, knowing that these jurisdictions provide transportation, uh, transportation services qualifying under the RVHT program. Uh, the district set a deadline to receive the funding request from service providers. This date would allow time to process the request and submit the RVHD grant uh, to application to ODOT, uh, Public Transit Division, by September 18th. Due to the short timeline between the funding notification and the application submittal deadline, ODOT Public Transit Division agreed to receive project approvals from boards, commissions, and councils after the application submittal deadline. And this is different, uh, those of you who are familiar with our, our typical STF process, we would be bringing our projects to you before submitting the application and do the short turnaround time ODOT is agreeing because we would have not had an opportunity to do that uh, due to the timing of their notice and the receipt of the applications. So they will accept uh, your input after the fact. The city of Woodburn requested $30,000 of RVHD funding for the following project. The project will fund city of Woodburn's volunteer medical transportation program that will provide eligible veterans with fare free round trip rides to their out of town medical appointments. The Woodburn Veterans Medical Tr uh, Transportation Program is experienced with, uh, currently is experienced and has uh, currently provides rides, uh, medical transportation services for disabled and less mobile Woodburn residents. Last year, WM BMT provided a total of 1,355 round trip rides and 39,483 miles were driven by volunteers and staff. 
WM, or WVMT's goal is to provide this number of rides or more in fiscal year 21. Uh, their application information uh, that goes into more detail about how they qualify and how they provide these rides into Portland and Salem and areas around Woodburn as a critical part or part of your application or your uh, board memo. Uh, many veterans live in assisted living facilities and senior housing in Woodburn where 65 plus demographic is about 17% of the population. To promote the program, staff will distribute brochures describing eligibility and services to these facilities and other veteran specific meeting locations and events in Woodburn. Staff will also offer presentations, goal of at least four, during the project period, as well as connect with veteran serving organizations for the assistance in promoting the program. The project requested was presented to the Special Transportation Fund Advisory Committee on September 16th of 2020. The STFAC reviewed the project request and then approved the project for recommendation to the board by a unanimous vote. The draft minutes of the STFAC has not, uh, uh, the draft minutes, and that's a, it's a draft because we have not met since uh, this meeting to formally approve the minutes are in your uh, materials as attachment A. The, since this is a project for uh, a different agency, there is no financial impact. However, should the application for the Rural Veterans Healthcare Transportation uh, Grant be awarded, staff will return to the board with a resolution to request the appropriate, appropriate $30,000, additional appropriation of $30,000 into the fiscal year 21 budget. So staff recommends the special and the special transportation fund advisory committee recommends that the board approve the city of Woodburn's project funded through the rural veterans healthcare transportation program. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Dickey? Director Richards. Yes, I've had several friends that have said that there was some kind of a mention of possibility of having a route to run from Salem to Albany, uh, and I hadn't heard anything about it, and I just wondered if there was any possibility of such a, a, a run. President Davidson, uh, Director Richards, uh, that is a project that is uh, a different project than this. It is, it is being considered through a feasibility study, and that is... Um, being funded with the statewide transportation improvement fund uh, grant uh, but that is separate from this project and separate from this funding source well i'm sorry i did i don't know exactly how these things all fit together but but these people have been think that's a pretty decent idea thank you we'll be sure to get updates on that as that progresses the, the Albany piece. Are there any questions about the, the Woodburn uh, veteran transport? I, I had just one question. Well, one comment, one question. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for staff for being proactive and reaching out to Polk County and Fall Cities, uh, recognizing that they had a need and given the short timeline, uh, making sure that they were aware of that. I, I appreciate that. And then, um, do you know if ODBA or ODOT has indicated when the next funding cycle comes around that they'll try and uh, have a longer grant period? I, I would hate to see another one month long timeline happen again. Uh, President Davidson, uh, this pro program initially was a one time allocation. So what they're hoping is to be able to provide data to show that it was highly successful and then approach the legislature to make this a permanent allocation. So at this time, there is not a set date of when that would occur, but they are hoping to be able to bring this back to the legislature to uh, have a, um, a set aside of the lottery dollars specifically to this program. Great, thank you. Director Wynn. Dovetailing on your uh, note, President Davidson, thank you for staff for uh, again being proactive as a granddaughter of a colonel in the um, 
Army Rangers. Uh, I really appreciate it when our work can um, really work at the intersectionality because the so social determinants of health for those that live in rural communities, accessing health is um, critical importance to them, as well as the veterans um, who have given so much for our country. So I appreciate your work. Director Bush. Sorry to belabor that point, but um, I, I too appreciate, oops, am I out? Yeah, I um, appreciate the, the reaching out to Falls City. I know they've struggled in the past and um, given, keeping relationships on positive notes is always good. We know these people need it. Let's touch base with them and see if they, they need it right now. And then again, um, the veterans piece, having had um, an army serviceman and two Marines and some sons-in-laws who have served, I appreciate uh, the extra service we are trying to provide for those. Thanks. That actually, so given that this is a, a one, one year or Actually, I don't know the timeline, but a pilot project in that there's a possibility that the legislature may fund this in the future. Um, are we, as the grants, at least the pass through grants entity, are we able to ensure that uh, Woodburn will be providing that relevant data to ODBA and ODOT? So if the reports come back good, that um, we can continue this kind of project? Uh, President Davidson, yes, the, this program, uh, much like the STF program, does have a, a quarterly reporting requirement, and that data will be shared with uh, ODOT and ODBA uh, through the process that they have set up. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, um, would someone like to propose a motion? Director Wynn. Thank you. I move that the board approves the STFAC's recommendation to the fund uh, to fund the City of Woodburn's project funded through the Rural Veterans Health Care Transportation Program. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Director Krebs. Uh, I second the motion. Okay, we have a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, if there's no discussion, Ms. Galeazzi, could you please call the roll? Uh, President Davidson? Aye. Uh, Director Wynn? Aye. Director Carney? Aye. Director Richards? Aye. Director Bush? Aye. Director Enojos Pressey? Aye. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on with our agenda to the approval, the approval of identified statewide transportation improvement fund projects. Okay, I ask Director Dickey to again uh, present the staff report. Uh, President Davidson, members of the board, it is uh, time for our next biennium of statewide transportation improvement fund or STEF funding uh, to begin. Uh, it, it seems that it was in some ways not very long ago, but also in some ways like a, a lifetime ago that the, that the first round of that funding uh, was before us. The great opportunities that it has provided for us to provide uh, additional service to our communities. And so now we are beginning to uh, prepare for the fiscal 20, 2021 to 2023 biennium. The first part of this process will be the discretionary process. So let me give just a, a brief background. If you recall, the, the program has set aside uh, 90% of the funding will go to a formula allocation of these funds that is based on a, a model that's similar to the STF model. Um, that is a process that we will be coming back to uh, present to you later on. Uh, I would have to actually check my notes to see the dates, but it's either at the end of December or probably in the January board meeting and then uh, the submittal is, uh, we'll probably come in um, the submittal is uh, the March, at the beginning of March is the, the deadline for that. But the other portion of it is the uh, 
portion, they set aside 4% um, for the state transportation network, which is a network to uh, funding to improve connections between communities. And then a discretionary portion that is set aside for projects that are typically one-time expenditures, uh, pilot projects, planning projects, the, the project that uh, Director Richards mentioned earlier about the Salem to Albany transportation feasibility study was funded with one of those in our first, uh, first set of applications. So tonight we are bringing to you two projects for the upcoming biennium of statewide transportation network uh, statewide, uh, one is a, would be targeted probably to the statewide transportation network, um, potentially, and then the other uh, would be for the discretionary. Um, there is some flexibility in some of these funding decisions on ODOT's behalf. So with uh, one of these projects, they may choose to fund it through the discretionary portion as well. Tonight, uh, uh, it's also, as a reminder, this is uh, a result of the 2017 House Bill 2017 package that has made this possible. Two projects have been selected by staff to be brought forward and recommended uh, for application for funding. And these projects um, are to purchase new smaller buses that will be used to better fit the needs of our community. Uh, these. Uh, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. And then the second is the funding to support the next phase of the South Salem Transit Center project. So first, let me talk a little bit about the buses. The small bus project is being proposed to better meet the needs of the community and provide the tools to reach farther into the neighborhoods with less intrusion or in less intrusive size vehicle. The small buses would initially be used on routes like 26 uh, Glen Creek Orchard Heights 27 Glen Creek Eola, and 14 Windsor Island Road. These are coverage routes that smaller buses would be able to handle the ridership and be a better fit for the neighborhood streets that they serve. For the project, uh, for the project, the request would be to purchase four low floor cutaway buses with a total funding request for the project of $655,956. These buses could also be used as we explore microtransit options into areas that are not currently served by transit. The second project the South Salem, the, is for the South Salem Transit Center. The South Salem Transit Center is just starting the process to contract with a consultant to conduct a site selection process. In fact, on Monday, the staff will meet to score uh, the proposals that we have received for that uh, contract and we'll be bringing that to you in December for uh, an award. The award of the contract uh, as it will be on December 17th meeting, and once the site selection project is complete, the project will progress to the final uh, site selection and land acquisition. This will be followed by design, engineering, and completion of the National Environmental Policy Act evaluation process. Once these steps are completed, the next step will be construction of the facility. The district has currently planned to use 1,802,953,000 of Federal Admin Transit Administration Section 5339 funds from fiscal years 2018 through 2020. The statewide transportation improvement fund revenues in this request will be used as the local match against the federal funds. The total amount being requested from the stiff discretionary program is $600,000. This will provide $450,730 to match the FTA 5339 grants, and the remaining 149,262 for a 25% contingency due to volatile costs in identifying project area at this time. Using these funds for these projects will better equip the district to grow and improve the ability to serve the needs of the community. This will be for both now and as Salem Area Mass Transit District expands its ways to serve the greater region more efficiently and better serve our customers in the future. Since this is an application, there is no financial impact in the current budget. If these projects are approved for funding, the approved amount will be included in the appropriate budget year for the project. 
Staff recommends the board approve the identified statewide transportation improvement fund projects application for the fiscal year 2021 to 2023 biennium. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Director Bush. Um, um, Mr. Dickey, what is the microtransit options? The microtransit is a way to serve neighborhoods through a variety of, of service designs. It can include deviated routes. It can, it can be a demand response service. If you recall a few years back, we did the West Salem connector. That would be an example of microtransit. Microtransit uh, is often used now as uh, to fulfill what is known as, in mean, most, a lot of places, as the first mile, last mile of people being able to connect to our main line or our core network or to transit centers where they can transfer to our larger buses to get uh, on frequent service. But the advantage to this is that it gives you the flexibility to cover a much larger area without having to dedicate uh, routes or drivers and vehicles to specific routes that um, may not have the demand that would support uh, running on a specific route in, in those areas. And it gives the flexibility for variable uh, demand uh, from different people based on what their needs are. And, and it does incorporate uh, a lot more of uh, technology access to be able to make that work. But it, it is something that grants a greater degree of flexibility while providing a higher level of coverage into the neighborhood areas. Thank you very much. Other questions? Director Carney. Um, thank you, President Davidson. Um, and these seem like very worthy projects. I'm curious, were there other projects that were considered? Um, and if so, how did these projects become the ones that the district prioritized for promotion and potential inclusion in the step. Uh, President Davidson, Director Carney, some of the criteria are that brought us to this conclusion is uh, projects that are funded with the discretionary pot of money really need to be one-time only expenditures. Um, funding any type of service with this really is uh, limited to a pilot project that has an identified uh, funding source that will pick up once the pilot is over if the pilot is deemed successful. Uh, so it is a funding source that is frequently used for um, improvements for or facilities, uh, for feasibility studies, uh, for the purchase of vehicles. Uh, one of the things that we are faced with right now is uh, to expand service beyond where we are right now, we have to expand our fleet capacity. Um, but we're also looking at the, the uh, transition from being just a large bus transit system to being a mobility integrator. And part of that involves adopting uh, new ways of serving our community and adapting uh, different approaches uh, to, to accomplish that. So these two projects uh, meet those criteria in that this is one time only money uh, that would be to a specific project. Uh, there were not a lot of other out, uh, options out there that weren't a, a, a deviation of something of this nature and based on our priorities of what were our most urgent needs for this is uh, where we felt that the, that the greatest uh, value would be. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is based on the amount of money that is available, we could have we could have asked for a lot more, but we also realize that uh, the state is looking at how do we allocate these funds to, to serve the broadest reach throughout the state. And just one follow on question. When, um, when will the 21-23 stiff be approved by ODOT or created by ODOT, um, and, and we will know the outcome of our proposed projects. 
President Davidson, Director Carney, I don't have that date specifically in front of me. Uh, that date is available. Uh, we can get that uh, that date to uh, General Manager Pollock and have that uh, out to the, uh, the members of the, the board. It, it will be sometime later uh, in 2021. Okay, yeah, not not urgency behind that request. Um, just more sort of trying to wrap my head around the cycles and how they all fit together. Director Bush. Yes, thank you, President Davidson. Another follow-up question then. So process-wise, does this still have to go through the, our, our um, MPO, the Salem Kaiser Area Transportation Study process and approval? Uh, President Davidson, Director Bush, this process uh, is a little bit different than the the formula process. The discretionary process first is a direct application from the applicants to ODOT. ODOT then will review these for eligibility under the program criteria. Then they will return the applications to us. We will then present the, them to our ed, our advisory committees. Our advisory committees will provide their feedback and they will not only review our application, but any application from uh, agencies that are within Marion and Polk County, or if there is a project that would come uh, come into Marion or Polk County. So uh, the last time we did this, uh, and that's been a while, but uh, if you recall, Canby had a project for uh, their 99E corridor that came down in because they come into Woodburn, we had to uh, provide input on that. Cascades West, West Council of Governments has a 99W project that travels through Polk County. So we also provided feedback on that. And likewise, any project that we would do that would go into other, other jurisdictional areas, they would weigh in on our project as well. So then after it goes through that process, the Area Commissions on Transportation get their chance to provide feedback. And that information then is all fed through to, uh, to ODOT. And then they take a look at that. Now the formula funds, it's more in the line of like we would do with our STF or 5310, where our advisory committee looks at these, they make a recommendation to the board, the board makes a recommendation, then that package of applications or plans are submitted to ODOT then they also get feedback from the area commissions and and so on. Uh, they don't typically go to the MPOs because of the the breadth of the area of coverage is often outside of the MPO boundaries. So the MPO boundaries are strictly limited to the urbanized areas. Thank you, that puts it in a nice package for me. Appreciate that. Mr. Dickey, to follow up with that, so ultimately does it go to the Oregon Transportation Commission for final decision? President Davidson, yes, you are correct. The, the final decision then after it's gone through all of the area commissions on transportation, the uh, boards and, the, and then uh, the ODOT will put that together in a package and that will be forwarded to the Oregon Transportation Commission and the, the Oregon Transportation Commission is the final say on both the discretionary and the formula side of, of this program. And that is what at that meeting, once they have uh, gaveled down on the approved set of projects, that it is a reality and then ODOT goes to work in creating the, the paperwork for the, the money to flow. So to put it maybe a little bluntly, we're, we're competing against localized peer agencies in the initial phase at the act level and then we're ultimately competing with other transit agencies in at a statewide level at the otc level is that is that a fair assessment president davidson yes the for this discretionary portion it is a ultimately a statewide uh for lack of a better term competition for these these funds the formula funds are allocated through a formula to the the jurisdictions across the state so that is a little bit less of uh a, a competitive nature, but these are competitive grants in the discretionary portion of the pro program. 
I noticed that we're requesting 1.255 million. Um, what's the total available funds for that 10% uh, discretionary? Uh, President Davidson, I don't have that dollar amount in front of me, but it is um, something that we do have. And again, I can get that uh, to General Manager Pollock. Um, it is uh, the sum total of the two uh, subgroups of the discretionary or 9% of the overall uh, funds that are available statewide. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm probably asking very weedsy questions because uh, for my day job, I manage a grant for the state. And so there's a fair amount of, you know, uh, maybe game theory at play with asking for how much money, especially in these discretionary or competitive type grants. And so um, I, once this is all, uh, all done and uh, taken care of, I'd be curious to see where, what the ultimate breakdown is of, across the state of these discretionary funds. Um, so if next round, we, we might be able to um, secure potentially a, additional funding. Um, and then uh, my last two questions were around timelines. It, it sounds like there, this is a multi-step process that could take quite a bit of time. What, what's our expected timeline on getting final decision by OTC? Uh, President Davidson, again, that is a date I don't have in front of me. I will uh, get that to General Manager Pollock and he can distribute that to the, the members of the board. Sure. Um, and for the South Salem Transit Center, this may be an unreasonable question, but I'm also curious on timelines here. Uh, let's say, you know, we're able to get OTC approval, spend that, um, you know, 600,000 along with the, the federal match how long does the approval process take? So even before we break ground, do you have a sense of how long that might take? President Davidson, I, I'm, let, me, let me see if I'm understanding your, is it, are you asking about the approval process for the, the grant or for the, the actual process to go through because there are numerous approvals sure. from TA, uh, from the environmental side, from design uh, review. So, yeah, I, I, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I guess what I'm attempting to ask is, once funded, how long will the you know design search or excuse me, location search, design, permitting, everything else? I, I guess what I'm really asking is. How excited should I get about the South Salem Transit Center? Is this a you know a two-year time scale? Like, where do I need to tone down my excitement levels? <laughs> President Davidson, um, yes. So the 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 contract that we are uh, in the process of going through the solicitation, uh, that timeline for the site selection and uh, service evaluation for that is going to be quite involved. Uh, and it is probably going to be in the neighborhood of 14 to 16 months to complete that process. Um, as you're getting close to the end of that process, though, that does not mean you have to wait till that is completely done before you begin the next phases of putting together your request for proposals, your scope of work and such for the design and engineering. But you, you really can't do a design and engineering scope of work until you have a site selected because there are so many variables in, in what would be uh, needed to be included in, in the specifications. So typically what you're looking at then is if once you get to the point of um, completing the site selection process, the property acquisition piece can vary significantly. Um, it can be a, a matter of a few months just to go through your typical uh, negotiations and escrow and uh, the inspections that have to take place there to several months if there are um, any issues identified that need to be uh, addressed or if there is uh, further negotiation with the property owner needed to be able to uh, uh, achieve that or if it is a property that is that is so desirable and is really the only preferred option that the board would elect to exercise them in that domain, that can actually go quite long. Um, that step to the side, then engineering and design is typically about six months uh, for a facility of this size. And then construction is uh, typically uh, 
uh, close to a year for something this that uh, involves all of, that would be involved with the with the facility of this nature, uh, from start to finish, from the from the groundbreaking to we're open for business. Um, so it is out a few years before we would have the doors open, but uh, we are looking for ways to uh, make it as quick, happen as quickly as possible. And of course, some of that also is dependent upon the availability of funding. Uh, we have the funding for uh, project uh, to get through most of the direction, but we don't have the funding yet secured for the construction. And that is, that's a critical piece of it. Great, thank you very much. And thanks for humoring me with my questions. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Dickey? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is um, a request to authorize the general manager to execute an amendment with our uh, security services. Oh, we, we, need to vote. No, we this is an we need to vote on something. We sure do. All right. Uh, who would like to uh, make the motion? Director Bush. Yes. I, I move that the board approve the identified statewide transportation, uh, transportation improvement fund projects application for the FY 2021 to 2023 biennium. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Director Richards. We have a second. Uh, any discussion? I think I've already expressed this, but I'm very excited for both of these projects. So really happy and grateful for all the work that staff has done on this. Um, Ms. Dahlia, oh, Director Bush. Yes, I just want to say I appreciate um, Mr. Dickey's patience with all of us and our questions and his wealth of information is um, infinite. Thank you. I share, I share a very similar feelings. Uh, Ms. Galeazzi, could you call us a roll call vote, please? Okay, Director Wynn. Aye. Director Carney. Aye. Director Richards. Aye. Aye. Director Bush? Psst. Aye. Director Inahos Pressey? Aye. Director Krebs? Aye. President Davidson? Aye. All right. Thank you. Um, now we'll go on to the next uh, action item. General Manager Pollock. Thank you. So I'll ask uh, Deputy General Manager Trimble to uh, open up this report. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. I'd like to actually uh, toss this to uh, Karen Garcia, our Security and Emergency Management Manager. Karen. Good evening, President Davidson and members of the board. Shall the board authorize the general manager to execute contract amendment number two with Allied Universal for additional transit security services unarmed in the amount of $104,550, bringing the total contract amount to $2,156,431. This action is necessary because the proposed amendment increases the contract amount that was pre previously authorized by the board. So we have a contract with Allied Universal to provide our security services. These officers are certified by the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training and are unarmed security professionals. They staff both the Downtown Transit Center and the Kaiser Transit Center during all of our local service hours. Back in 2017, we had a competitive procurement process to select Allied, and in November of 2017, the board authorized the general manager to execute a contract with Allied Universal. We are in a contract that has a three-year base with two one-year options on the end. As part of our enhanced service, the board authorized the general manager to amend that contract at the August 2019 meeting um, those services were needed, again, to support our enhanced services, the later weeknight, the Saturday, Sunday, and holiday services. This 
proposal this evening is necessary to amend the contract once more to ensure safety at the transit centers and increase the growing needs of security for chariots. It includes a decrease of 10 hours of security officer coverage each week. These hours are no longer needed past they were used to provide security in the customer service lobby after the customer service staff closed the window. Additionally, this amendment would fund a full-time lead officer position, which is needed to help with the increased activity at the downtown transit center and the activity that we're seeing in the service area in general. Uh, as a reminder, our security team is a partnership between chariots, employees, our contract with Allied Universal, and then our intergovernmental agreement with the City of Salem for Police Services. As far as financial impact, the funds necessary for the contract along with this amendment were included in the fiscal year 2021 general funds budget, and funding will be included in future budgets until the termination of this contract, which is scheduled for December 31st of 2022. Staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to execute contract amendment number two with Allied Universal for additional transit security services unarmed for an amount totaling $104,550 and a not to exceed total contract amount of $2,156,431. And I'm happy to entertain any questions at this time. Are there any questions from Ms. Garcia? Okay, no questions. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Director Krebs. I move that the board authorize the general manager to execute contract amendment number two with Allied Universal for additional transit security services unarmed or not to exceed total contract amount of two million one hundred fifty-six thousand four hundred thirty-one dollars. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Director Carney has seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay. Seeing no discussion, uh, Ms. Galiazzi, could you please do a roll call vote? Director Carney. Aye. Director Richards? Aye. Director Bush? Aye. Director Enohos Pressey? Aye. Director Krebs? Aye. President Davidson? Aye. Director Wynn? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, next on the agenda is the uh, fiscal year 2021 board priorities and principles, and I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so as you may remember last month's work session, uh, we looked at uh, a document that I, I had drafted uh, for your consideration. The, on, on page 56 is the, of your board packet is the proposed fiscal year 2021 board priorities and principles. Um, several of your um, suggestions in the discussion uh, in the work session have been incorporated into this document. And, and thankfully, um, some of the wording has been improved by uh, trained professionals as opposed to myself. So uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Feeney and others for that work. Um, I just as a reminder, this document, as I initially envisioned it, was to serve as a uh, kind of a guide to help us as we navigate our roles as we serve on external committees um, so that we have confidence in what we as individuals are representing when we represent the board and the district as a whole. Um, this document would uh, be something that is updated annually. So if there's something that you see on here that you'd like to see added or subtracted or changed, this is absolutely something, I, I'm envisioning this to be an iterative document that we work on every year. Um, and it would be similar to our annually adopted legislative priorities list. Um, so this is a list, uh, you'll notice that unlike the legislative 
agenda. This does not have a, a ranking of priorities. Um, these are five, excuse me, six, no five, five different items that we uh, consider as we serve on these different um, uh, committees. So um, I'm happy to entertain any questions or discussion. I prefer discussion. Director Bush. Um, I just, in first glance of re-looking at it again, I appreciate the attention towards the pedestrian and bicyclist infrastructure, particularly the pedestrian, because our sidewalks in Salem and Kaiser area definitely need some work. And I know that the NPO, MPO, Metropolitan Organization, SCATS, Salem Kaiser Area Transportation Study, yes. <laughs> They've been working on complete streets, complete sidewalk system, and um, having um, support from us will be a great deal of help to them. Agreed. Thank you, Director Bush. Director Carney, it looked like you were going to say something. Maybe not. Um, sure, I can always, I, I always have something to say. <laughs> President Davidson, this looks really great, and I think the the edits and modifications have improved it. And uh, I appreciate you undertaking this in terms of bringing us some common guidance and a language um, to to sort of advocate for the needs of the transit district in our larger community decisions. So thank you for undertaking this, and and thank you to the staff that lent their hand in improving things um, and bringing us what we have here. Thanks. Other questions or comments? If not, um, would someone like to, you know what? I'm gonna take privilege. I'm gonna make the motion. Um, I move that the board adopt the fiscal year 2021 priorities and principles as shown in attachment A. I will second that. Thank you, Director Carney. We have second, any discussion? I think it's a great document and it has some good insight for us. Thank you, Director Cubs. Others? Okay, if there's no further discussion, Ms. Galeazzi, could you do a roll call vote? Director Richards. Aye. Director Bush. Aye. Director Inahos Pressey. Aye. Director Krebs. Aye. Director Davidson. Aye. Uh, Director Wynn? Aye. Director Carney? Aye. Okay, unanimous. Okay, unanimously passed. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is the item that we added at the beginning of the meeting, which is um, uh, action on the discussions that we had in executive session surrounding labor negotiations. Um, General Manager Pollock, could you maybe brief us? Oh, yes. Uh, Director Dixon to uh, provide a quick summary of the executive session and the action to be taken. Uh, thank you. Good evening, uh, President Davidson and members of the board. Uh, the executive session, we discussed a tentative agreement for a new labor contract. Our current labor contract expires in June, 30, June 30th of this year. Typically, we would start negotiations in October. Uh, we looked at the current situation and some of the uncertainty with funding levels and service levels and uh, explored an option to extend the current contract for one year with all of its um, provisions and uh, went to a vote of the bargaining unit on October 12th. They passed it, uh, 85 in favor, 12 against. And then right at this evening, we are recommending that the board also um, approve this tentative agreement. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Are there any questions for her? Okay, um, Director Krebs, I believe you might have a motion on this. 
I move that we accept the staff recommendation to extend the labor contract for one year. Okay. We have a motion. Um, is there a second? Director Wayne. I second. Okay, we have a second. Um, is there any discussion? Just please. Thank you, President Davison. Just a comment um, that I know that this will help our um, represented employees have a, a stronger sense of security with their work with us in this time of insecurity, and that will it'll keep us a uh, give us more stable um, district going forward. So, thank you. Agreed. I, I would just act, like to echo those comments that I'm, I'm glad that we were able to come to a, a, an agreement that I think works very well for the district as a whole, but also for represented employees. Okay, um, with that, Ms. Galeazzi, could you please uh, call the roll for the vote? Director Bush? Aye. Director Inahos Pressey? Aye. Director Krebs? Aye. President Davidson? Aye. Director Wynn? Aye. Director Carney? Aye. Director Richards? Aye. Director Bush? Ooh, I never mind. <laughs> That's okay. Unanimous. <laughs> okay. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that concludes our action items portion of our agenda. We'll move on along to the informational reports. The first being the security and emergency preparedness report. So I'll ask uh, Manager Garcia to please present the report. Good evening, once more, President Davidson and members of the board. Um, I am pleased to share the fiscal year 20 security report with you all this evening. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier this evening, our security team has really got three key components, which include security uh, members of Chariots, our private security partner within Allied Universal, and, and our partners at the Salem Police Department. Next slide. As you can see, all of us work very closely together. This isn't the whole team because we can't ever get everyone together all in the same place, but it is a very comprehensive uh, team and we all have different things that we bring to the table that complement each other, which I think provides a holistic approach for chariot security. Next slide. So our overall responsibilities as a team is to provide information about the chariot services, address any security and safety concerns, really look at our security statistics like we're doing this evening, provide a strong presence at the transit centers and on the system to deter unwanted behavior by members of the public, develop policies and procedures, regulate behavior through the use of our ordinances, and maintain a safe environment for all of our stakeholders, and that would include our riders, employees, and other members of the public. Next slide. Our private security provider is Allied Universal Security. They provide certified unarmed security professionals. And again, they staff at our both of our transit centers, the Kaiser Transit Center and Downtown Transit Center during all of our local hours of service. And they are here to help deliver on our brand promise of a world-class customer experience. So they assist our riders with using the chariot services they are a visible presence on the transit center. If you've been to either one of the transit centers, I'm sure you can see them from a mile away in their high vis yellow uniforms. Um, they provide, respond to a variety of incident types, not all security related, but a variety of incident types, which we'll talk about this evening. They also do ordinance enforcement and issue exclusions from our service. And they request police as needed to assist with complex situations or to help us address law violations and criminal behavior on the property. Next slide. The IGA that we have with the city of Salem is 
longstanding agreement for police services. As it stands in the current IGA, we have access to an on-call sworn officer Monday through Saturday from noon each day until 9 p.m., which is quite a bit of our service span at the moment. They assist us with crime prevention efforts. They respond as needed to the transit center to investigate crime and respond to crimes in service. They do a lot to manage activities that occur around the property that are outside of the jurisdiction that our private security and our staff members have. And we'll talk about jurisdiction here in a moment. They also help facilitate access to community social services for those in need, because as you can imagine, we have a lot of people that come to the transit center and that use our transit services that are in need of those services. They're also instrumental in assisting us with youth safety incidences. And they're a good community stakeholder and partner for us to enhance livability. Um, we started up and facilitated a stakeholder group just about a year ago, Chariots did, where we brought in the Salem Police Department and many other jurisdictions and partners in the community to really have a good discussion about solutions to some of the behavioral problems that we were experiencing at Courthouse Square. So we'll talk about some of those things this evening. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about jurisdiction because I, I would like the board to understand that we do have limitations at the Downtown Transit Center. I think that sometimes members of the public look at activities on the block and wonder what Chariots is doing to fix all those problems. And I wanted to express that our ordinances do limit us. There are property lines that are based on different property ownership um, at Courthouse Square. And so it does limit our ability to take action on certain things. So our primary ordinance is the police ordinance that was created back in 2000. It's been amended a few times since then, but that police ordinance applies to all chariots owned and operated property. So it applies to the Kaiser Transit Center. And then at the Downtown Transit Center, it's the bus bay areas and inside the customer service lobby. This ordinance has a, a long list of behavioral expectations, one of which is we expect people to be on our property for the purpose of conducting business with us, riding the transit system and using chariots. The second ordinance that we really apply is called the Courthouse Square Police Ordinance. This one was first adopted by the board back in 2004. It too has had a couple of amendments, but this ordinance is very, uh, it's less restrictive. It really addresses criminal behavior on these properties and it applies on the condo property, the, the property that is commonly owned by us and Marion County. And that would include the North Block, which is along Chemeketa Street, it also includes the Hatfield Plaza area along High Street, just outside our customer service area windows. Um, and then the third layer of jurisdiction that we have at Courthouse Square is the city sidewalks. So basically everything outside of the brick pillars at the Downtown Transit Center, we have absolutely no jurisdiction to address any behavior at all. That is city property. And so it's up to the city and the police department to enforce or, uh, Oregon law and Salem revised code on those sidewalks. Hopefully that'll help you understand some of the challenges that we face in our enforcement and in our patrols throughout the day. Next slide. So to get into the numbers, if you have not seen the security report graphs before, let me just explain a little bit about the layout. The blue is showing last year, so the fiscal year 19 numbers. The red is for fiscal year 20. On this particular graph, and on many, but not all, to come forward, on the left side is the downtown transit center numbers, and on the right side is the Kaiser Transit Center numbers. So this graph shows customer service contacts. We have a primary role to provide service to people using our bus service. So uh, the security staff help people ride the service. They help identify what route people need to get to their destination, let them know what time the bus leaves, what bay they can catch that route at, things of that nature all fall into the customer service contacts. And as you can see, we had some pretty consistent numbers until quarter four and surprise what happened. 
the coronavirus pandemic, which um, I'm sure you'll see a pattern throughout the evening on these graphs. A lot of things changed for us in quarter four. So the reason that the number of customer service contacts went through the roof in quarter four is because we were contacting nearly every customer to make sure people were wearing proper facial coverings, that they were physically distanced on our property, and that they were initially only here to ride chariots for essential trips only. That has changed and opened up over the last several months. But initially, we were contacting nearly every customer at the down transit center to make sure that they were using the bus service for an essential trip only. Next Manager slide. Garcia, before yes. we move on, one, one quick question. Customer service contacts, is this specifically Allied Universal or does this encompass the three partner agencies? Thank you for that question, President Davidson. These numbers are for Allied Universal Security. They Great, do not need any numbers for the police department. Next slide. This graph shows the exclusions from our service and the written warnings that were issued over the last year. On the left side of this graph, it shows the exclusions that were issued. On the right side, the written warnings. So our exclusions, um, excuse me, our exclusions are outlined in the ordinance and we are allowed if people don't comply with the behavior expectations in the ordinance to issue exclusions um, and prohibit people for a period of time from using the, the bus service. Um, our private security partners normally manage that system and issue the majority of our exclusions to customers. But we do like to use written warnings as a tool for compliance because it's never our goal to, to remove people's ability to use the service. We really only exclude if it's um, a serious offense or if we can't gain compliance through lesser means. In quarter one and quarter two, you'll notice that the number of exclusions that were issued were much higher than in fiscal year 19. That was because of the escalation of activity and behavior that we were seeing at the downtown transit center. In quarter four, the numbers decreased significantly because of the less, uh, the fewer riders that we had on our system and at the transit centers. Next slide. This slide shows the ordinance warnings. So like I said, we try to gain compliance through lesser means, one of which we call public education or ordinance warnings. We like to let people know what they can and cannot do on the property in accordance with the ordinance. So we like to share things like, I'm sorry, sir, you can't ride your bike here. Or if you're going to smoke, would you please smoke in the designated smoking area? That's what these types of warnings are about, is those minor infractions that are just about livability and comfort for all of our customers. In quarter three, we did have a decrease. This was a little pre-COVID. COVID kind of came at the end of that third quarter, but we did have a lot of staff turnover. Um, at that time, we had eight security officers assigned to that contract, and three of them left the contract, and we had three brand new officers. So I really believe that the numbers went down in quarter three because of the amount of staff turnover. We had a lot of training and things like that that were going on. And then in quarter four, again, ridership was down. So the ordinance warnings reflect ridership decrease. Next slide. This slide shows a breakdown of what those warnings were actually issued for. Um, the four colors are basically for the four seasons of the year, the yellow representing summer, the orangish red, fall, blue is winter, and then the green is the fourth quarter, which was the spring. And you can see we have everything from, you know, soliciting and panhandling on the property, a lot of smoking warnings, we see that quite often, and then loitering. We expect people to catch the next bus to their destination and not just um, stay on the property for extended periods of time not using the service. So that's what the loitering thing is all about. We like to move folks on if they're not taking that opportunity to get on the next bus to their destination. Next slide. This is just an example of our allied universal security officers making contact with our riders. Next slide. So um, this graph represents the incident reports that our private security officers have generated. 
They do not include any incident reports submitted by our operators for incidences that happen out in the system. They also do not include any incidents where police were asked to respond and get involved. I'll share those police numbers with you later. So these are strictly incident reports where the private security addressed the problem. In quarter one and quarter two, specifically at the downtown transit center, the numbers were up a lot, especially quarter one. Again, that was due to the increased behavioral problems and activity that we were seeing at the downtown transit center and on the surrounding block. Quarter four, as we would expect, was way down. Our ridership was less than 50% during that quarter. So uh, we would expect that the incident report numbers would, would also reflect that. Next slide. This is a detailed breakdown of all the different types of incidents officers respond to and the numbers per quarter for each type. Next slide. So um, without pouring through that last graph, let me just point out the most common types of incidences that we responded to, that the security officers from Allied responded to. In 2020, the most common incidences were graffiti and vandalism, which was actually up from last year from 87 to 60. We also responded to a significant number of medical emergencies at the transit centers. And then the third most common type of incident was loitering. And if you look at that top paragraph on this slide, the top four last year were graffiti, medical, trespass and disorderly conduct. The five different types of incidences that are displayed on this screen, they just take turns from year to year uh, competing for the number one spot. But typically we see a lot of graffiti, we see a lot of medical emergencies. Um, we do see that loitering, the trespassing and disorderly conducts from year to year, that's pretty common. Next slide. So this is one of our police department partners making contact with one of our uh, customers. Uh, the police officers roam through the downtown transit center periodically throughout the shift and throughout the day to help with that presence at the transit center. And again, they also respond when we call and need their assistance managing behavioral or criminal behavior. Next slide. So these are requests for police. This is when we ask for the police to respond to our property. Uh, again, quarter one, two, and three, the numbers were up due to that increased behavior and activity at the downtown transit centers. And as we would expect, again, quarter four, the numbers were much lower. Uh, we did see uh, quite a bit of change in how Salem Police Department were approaching enforcement once the restrictions of COVID hit. It was, of course, many community um, restrictions. There were state restrictions that were put out by the governor. And so I think at that point, there were a lot of unknowns. People were really trying to keep their distance from folks as we still are today. But what we saw from the police was they would always respond and assist us when asked, but they were much more hands off, less likely to make an arrest, less likely to issue a citation. If they could gain compliance through lesser means, they were more likely to do that. Next slide. This is a breakdown of the different types of incidences that our police partners were involved in. Um, next slide. This shows the top incidences that were on that previous graph. So uh, the most common, again, are fairly consistent from year to year. This year in fiscal year 20, even though the numbers for police service, the call for police services and response were down quite a bit in quarter four, we still saw an overall increase from the previous year in fiscal year 19. We had only 171 and in fiscal year 20, we had 205. So the numbers went up just in the first three quarters of the year. Um, I would suspect that that would have continued to increase had quarter four been a normal quarter for us. And again, that's based on some of the increased activity and um, presence of people spending time at the downtown transit center that weren't really there to use the service. Uh, the top types of incidences, however, were disorderly conduct, trespassing, 
We have an other category, and the other category could include things like paraphernalia that's left behind on buses, um, loitering if we can't get a person to leave the property, if the, if the security officers can't get that person to leave the property and they need the police to respond and assist, vandalism to our shelters with glass being broken, um, problems with minors being intoxicated, things like that all fall in the other category. And the non-chariots incidences down there at the bottom of the slide, those include activities that the police were involved in on or around our property that did not have anything to do with chariots. So for instance, if there was a violation across the street and the police made contact with that person on our property, we would document that police activity on chariots property, but because the violation or crime happened elsewhere, um, we took no enforcement action with an exclusion or things like that, and we categorize it as a non-chariots event. Next slide. I always like to summarize the disorderly conduct um, for all of the services. So this slide talks about disorderly conduct, unruly or unwanted behavior. This includes all of the allied private security incident reports, as well as the police involved reports. So this is all disorderly conduct reports for the whole fiscal year for both entities. Um, in fiscal year 19, we had 59. In fiscal year 20, we had 68. So we did see a bit of an increase, uh, even though that ridership and the incident numbers were down in the fourth quarter. Of those 68 disorderly conduct incidences, 12 of them involved some level of assaultive behavior where physical contact was made between parties. That's actually a decrease from the previous year, so that was good to see that number. Of those 12, three involved Chariot's employees, and fortunately, no injuries were reported for those incidents. Next slide. This is a, an image of the downtown enforcement team. They currently have five officers on that team. They've got a couple of vacancies that will be filled um, January 1st. So I'm looking forward to having some new officers to work with. We got shorter this year because we had a, they had a retirement and they had a promotion from that team. So, um, but they do a great job for us. They're very responsive and help us quite a bit. We help them, they help us. It's a mutually beneficial uh, arrangement for both entities. Slide. So just to briefly talk about some continuous improvement, we're always working to provide a safer and more secure environment for all of our stakeholders. So some things we have going on this year in fiscal year 21, uh, we have a security coordinator position that was approved in the budget this year. We've actually recruited and successfully hired a person to fill that security coordinator role. He's been here for about six weeks and he's doing a fabulous job for the district, building that relationship with Allied Universal and with the Salem, Poli Salem Police Department. So I look forward to some great things coming from his position in the near future. Uh, the second item there is about the coronavirus pandemic. pandemic. I think that, that the COVID has impacted all businesses, including chariots, and it's in it's impacted the security staff because they interact with people differently because of COVID and because of the safety restrictions that we have in place today. So we're gonna continue our efforts to help remind people to wear facial coverings and to physical distance on our property to help uh, bolster the, the health safety efforts for everyone involved. Next slide. Uh, additionally, we are working on a scope of work to do some fence upgrades at the Dell Webb Operations Center. Uh, we also have a camera system replacement project in the works. We did quite a bit of work on this project last year, doing some product trials and a lot of market research on what's available in the, in the marketplace. So this year we are planning to go out for a, a solicitation to get a, a system identified and get some installation of some new cameras and some new software going during fiscal year 21. Next slide. The board has always supported our efforts for security. Um, you'll see me a couple times this year, once for this evening's Allied Universal Amendment, which I appreciate your support on. Thank you for the approval on that so that we can move forward. 
Later this year in the spring, early summer, I'll be bringing forth the IGA renewal with the city of Salem. That agreement ends at the end of this fiscal year, June 30th. So we'll be working after January to uh, work on an, a renewal agreement with the city. Next slide. And then finally, we also have an emergency coordinator position that was included in the budget for this year. In the next few months, we'll be recruiting to fill that position. So that will be an exciting addition to the security department, security and emergency management department team. The plan is for that emergency coordinator to assist us in updating our continuity of operations plan that we did a few years ago work with local emergency management representatives so that we are always at the table during those community emergency management conversations and then help develop our own internal comprehensive emergency response and recovery plans. Next slide. So staff recommends that the board receive the fiscal year 2020 security report and I'm happy to answer any questions that may have come up. Thank you. Are there any questions for Manager Garcia? Okay, uh, I've got a few. Um, one not question related, but as we're looking down at the Salem IGA agreement in the future, I would be very interested to see uh, response times and how quickly they're able to respond. Um, because to me, the difference between an IGA and a non-IGA is that we get some kind of um, speed preference. And so I, I, I'd be, that'd be one key metric that I'd be interested in seeing. Um, I'm wondering if you could, um, for the police activity, um, I assume that the vast majority of that stems from security initiated calls, um, but do, do police regularly patrol the courthouse square? What, I, I'm, I guess I'm curious what the breakdown is of police interactions, where they're coming from. Yes, that's a great question, President Davidson. So the majority of the police activity at courthouse square is generated by our private security provider. They see an incident or they make contact with an individual um, or there's some kind of disorderly behavior or there's a trespass going on, they will make contact with that individual and then they'll call the police to come in and assist. Um, additionally, I think that the partnership is really good between those two groups. And so if the security officers see activity downtown on the sidewalks, they may call the police and just recommend that they come and spend some time down in that area or do some patrols through the area because before COVID when we had a lot of people hanging out around the plaza area and spending time um, on that corner of the block it was pretty easy to tell when something was stirring up and so we would call upon the police to come down and be a presence to deter illegal behavior unwanted behavior um, fighting type of behavior and so we do go back and forth with them quite a bit of course, they do have that responsibility on the sidewalk. So if they are patrolling past or roving through the property and they see some activity on the sidewalk, they will stop and take an action. But most of the actions that they take that result in some type of incident report being generated is because they've been asked to come here to take an action because of some type of behavior or we need some kind of assistance because we will call them if we have someone who's having a mental health crises and we need to get that person connected to some level of resources, or if we can't provide the needed level of assistance to someone who, for instance, is homeless and needs access to a meal or a shelter, we will call the police in to help connect people with those resources that we may not be aware of at Chariots or the private security team. Thank you. Um, could you speak to the to property damage? It, it, it looks like graffiti and vandalism might be the, the most frequent types of property damage. Do you, do you have a sense of the cost that we're incurring maybe annually or quarterly on the, these types of property damage? Like, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of how big of a problem this is. Yes, President Davidson, the majority of the graffiti type incidences that we have had at the downtown transit center are tagging. Uh, actually, the public restrooms in the customer service lobby were 
pretty famous for getting tagged on a regular basis. So I do, wouldn't say that there's a high cost involved. It's for most graffiti, it's staff time, and then just the graffiti removal spray and wipe that the facilities staff use. But we do out in the system have quite a bit of shelter damage that we incur throughout the year. I don't have a number in front of me, but I could get that number and provide that to the general manager for you and the rest of the board members. But we have a lot of broken glass throughout the year that, that does incur a cost for us. But like I said, the majority of those graffiti and vandalisms are more, you know, tagging um, people using a Sharpie to write on the stall walls of the restroom. During the time we've had the lobby shut down because of COVID, those restrooms have actually been renovated. They look beautiful inside. So I'm hoping that with that refreshed look, that the number of graffiti incidences will go down when we reopen that public restroom. Great. And one last question, I think one last question for me. Um, could you maybe paint a picture for me of what uh, our security, like what are the steps before they call police? I, I recognize like if there's a an assault occurring, they're calling police, like, but I'm, for maybe for disorderly conduct, at what point do do they involve sworn officers? Yes, President Davidson, uh, the trigger point normally is a law violation. So when the officers are trained, they're told if it's an ordinance violation, strictly an ordinance violation, that is the responsibility of allied universal officers. If it turns into a criminal situation, then that's when we can call the police in, but we don't always call the police in. If it's a high level crime, obviously if we've got some kind of assaultive behavior or if we've got minors consuming alcohol or illegal use of drugs, we will always call the police in for those types of incidences. But minor events that the security officers can manage successfully, make contact with the individuals, if they can gain compliance and stop the behavior even if it's a minor criminal act, they don't always involve the police because it's not always necessary to go to that level. We don't always need somebody charged with a crime. We don't always aim to issue an exclusion to a person. Really, we just want compliance with the expectations so that everybody can ride safely. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. And I just one comment, I, I understand that we, of course, do not have our own police agency, and we, we rely quite a bit on City of Salem, uh, City of Kaijin, and Marion County Sheriff's Office, but it, it might be something that we as a board consider as um, encouraging those different jurisdictions to um, diversify the, res the kinds of response that they have. And so if there is a, a behavioral health incident at the courthouse square, perhaps sworn officers is not the, uh, pr the best response. And so um, that, while maybe best practice, we're of course at that point dependent on those jurisdictions and the services that they offer. Um, so um, as City of Salem and other jurisdictions consider alternative um, response kinds, I, I think there's a there's a nexus where Chariots is involved and in. um, at different points of time, we might be able to lend our voice to support those things. Any other questions? I, I've taken quite a bit of time. Director Bush. Um, I don't know that this is, thank you, President Davidson. I don't know if this is a question for um, Ms. Garcia, um, but I'm distracted by this cute boy there. <laughs> but um, I realize you made a comment about um, a lot of broken glass in our bus shelters. Um, is there some way that we could um, make our shelters something of something differently, different that would be sturdier or keep that from happening? I don't think I don't know if that's your question to answer, but uh, President Davidson and Director Bush, I think that's a great question. Of course, a few years ago, we did just get a significant amount of federal money to replace all the shelters in our system. So uh, there would probably be some need to use the shelter equipment that we have today, get that to the end of its useful life, perhaps before we could do a big cost lift to replace materials like that. But, uh, you know, I think that that would be a great thing for us to explore. Um, I think that we want to make sure that visibility is there. But with glass breakage, it does present a cost and it does present a safety hazard for folks in the community. 
property. So I think that things like that are always worth considering. Any other questions for Manager Garcia? All right, thank you very much. The, so next informational report is the briefing on the Triennial Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Goal. Okay, and I'll ask Director Dixon to kick off this section. Yes, I'm going to introduce Dan Knaus. He is our procurement manager, and he's going to provide a kind of a brief overview of the DBE program and a little more detailed information about how we delivered our, how we developed our goals. So, Dan. Thank you, Paula. Good evening, President Davidson and directors of the board and general manager, Paula. As most of you know, I'm Dan Knaus, and I serve as the procurement and contracts manager for the district. I'm pleased to present an informational briefing on the district's triennial disadvantaged business enterprise DBE goal for federal fiscal years 2021 through 2023. The board memo in your packet provides a brief summary of the program and the methodology by which we arrived at our goal of 2.49% for the three year period. Also included in your packet is our goal rationale that led to the development of our goal as well as other supporting documents. In the following presentation, I will be covering the information contained in the memo and goal rationale, along with some background on the DBE program and efforts that the district is taking to comply and foster DBE participation in our projects. Again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the, and share information relating to our DBE program. This short presentation will provide background on the DBE program and our goal setting methodology utilized to calculate our DBE participation goal for federal fiscal years 2021 through 2023, which began on October 1st of this year. This is an overall agenda to be covered in this presentation. First, we'll talk about the introduction and the DBE program. Then we'll get into DBE reports, our outreach programs and efforts there, our DBE goal development and the process steps that we follow uh, to implement the uh, goal uh, for the triennial. As part of our introduction, I'll be presenting an overview uh, of, the, uh, of the program, our Department of Transportation DBE definition, Title 49 CFR Part 26, CFR is the abbreviation for the Code of Federal Regulations, Salem Area Mass Transit District Policy Statement and Current Triennial Goal Period. I'm gonna read the next two slides aloud to set the understanding for what the program strives to achieve and what the definition of a DBE is for our purposes. So bear with me. Our, uh, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, otherwise known as the DBE Program. The U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT, originally established the program in 1980 to ensure that firms competing for projects funded through DOT are not disadvantaged by unlawful discrimination. The Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program is designed to remedy ongoing discrimination and the continuing effects of past discrimination in federally assisted highway, transit, airport, and highway safety financial assistant transportation contracting markets nationwide. The primary remedial goal and objective of the DBE program is to level the playing field by providing small businesses owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals a fair opportunity to compete for federally funded transportation contracts. The definition of a DBE DBEs are for-profit small business concerns where socially and economically disadvantaged individuals own at least, own at least 51% and also control management and daily business operations. Included in this classification are the following, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Pacific and subcontinent Asian Americans. Women are presumed to be socially and economic uh, disadvantaged as well. Other individuals can also qualify as socially and economically disadvantaged on a case-by-case -case basis. 
and to be regarded as economically disadvantaged, an, indiv an individual must have a personal net worth that does not exceed $1.32 million. The requirements for participating in the program, a small business owned and controlled socially and economically disadvantaged individuals must receive DBE certification from the rev rev relevant state in which they operate. <clears throat> Oregon uses the Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity, otherwise known as COVID, through the COVID Certification Management System. Uh, that group is responsible for providing the different classifications uh, that business owners can apply for. The district is a recipient of US DOT funding. As a condition of receiving this assistance, SAMTD signed an assurance that it will comply with FTA DBE requirements in accordance with Title 49 CFR Part 26 provisions entitled Participation by DBEs in U.S. DOT Programs. The district is required to not only establish a DBE program, but also to, to develop and submit an overall triennial DBE goal for its FTA assistance, uh, assisted projects. So Title 49 CFR Part, part 26 uh, the district complies with Title 49 Code of Federal Regulations Part 26 and their participation by disadvantaged business enterprises in the United States Department of Transportation programs. We have a policy statement which in part reads, the Salem Area Mass Transit District has established a disadvantaged business enterprise DBE program in accordance with regulations of the U.S. Department of Transportation DOT 49 CFR Part, part 26. SAMTD has received federal financial assistance from the DOT and as a condition of receiving the assistance, SAMTD has signed an assurance that will comply with 49 CFR Part 26. And for our purposes, the triennial goal period and the goal setting methodology for federal fiscal years 2020, uh, 2021 through 2023, which is actually October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2023. So we are required to submit periodic reports pertaining to our DBE efforts. These reports are generated through a combined effort of procurement, grants, and finance. The reports consist of FTA uniform DBE reports, FTA shortfall analysis, FTA triennial goal reports, and the ODOT uniform report. These reports are all detailed on the next slide and the reports are reviewed internally with the district CFO, procurement, and DBA DBE liaison officer are to bellow before they are submitted to the different agencies. The uniform DBE reports are due to, F to the FTA on a semi-annual basis and contain information on our DBE activity for the periods. They're due, as I said, twice a year on June 1st and December 1st. June 1st has the period of 10-1 through 3-31 and December 1st is represents the period of 4-1 through 9-30. We have a shortfall analysis report that is required when a recipient fails to meet its triennial DBE goal by the end of the fiscal year. Analysis of the reasons for the differences between the DBE awards and the stated goal during the, different, uh, during the period are addressed. It establishes next steps to correct the problems identified in the analysis to ensure attainment of the goal for the next period and these reports are due to FTA on an annual basis by December 29th of each year, year for, the, uh, for the calendar year preceding it. The triennial goal report for which we're uh, discussing tonight is, is established on a three-year basis and is filed with the FTA by October 1st of each year. Uh, the final report is the ODOT uniform DBE report is very similar to the uniform DBE reports we file for FTA. Uh, since ODOT is a federally funded recipient, they're required to flow it down to us. Uh, so their reports, our reports to them are due on May 15th and November 15th of each year so that they can in turn provide it to the FTA by uh, June 1st and December 1st. Recipients can't be penalized or treated as being in, in non-compliance for failing to meet the DBE goal unless the agency failed to administer the program in good faith. So there's no penal activity uh, for failing to meet a goal. 
or exceeding a goal uh, only if we fail to operate in good faith. We actively engage in public outreach as part of our DBE goal and good faith efforts. In this section, I'll discuss our barriers to participation, the governor's marketplace, reverse vendor trade shows, Salem Capital Connections, uh, uh, the districts doing business with Chariots Brochure, SAMTD and community events and the Chariots website. There are many barriers that impact the DBE participation with the district and the governmental agencies in general. Real and perceived barriers include, but are not limited to, awareness of the program and benefits, language barriers, certification and eligibility process, this is through the COVID system, technical capabilities and resources of the suppliers, perception of contracting or conducting business with governmental entities, complexity of bidding and contracting requirements, and the insurance and bonding requirements that we're required to have. This list re represents the major barriers that have been discussed with the small business communities and identified at outreach events that SAMTD staff have participated in and through communication with other agencies and organizations. We are working to bring awareness and education to the DBE community through various methods that will be discussed on the next, uh, that will be discussed on the next slides. The governor's marketplace is a, an, a tool where business communities are provided with education and are equipped with tools and resources to navigate the world of public contracting. This is a yearly event and it was originally scheduled for next Tuesday and Wednesday. However, it's been canceled this year due to COVID. It's held in Salem on an annual basis. The reverse vendor trade show is sponsored by the OPPA and NIGP. The uh, OPPA is the Oregon Public Procurement Association and NIGP is the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing, uh, which recently changed its name to NIGP the Institute for uh, Public Procurement. That's a, uh, and the reverse vendor trade show, show is a forum where public purchasing professionals, project managers and agencies provide information and op uh, opportunities to business communities. And it's held on an annual basis and the location changes based on the OPPA chapter that sponsors the event. Due to COVID-19 considerations, the event was canceled in 2020. Salem Capital Connections provides Oregon entrepreneurs and small businesses with the opportunity to connect with public and private entities that lead to substantial and sustainable business relationships and opportunities. This group meets on a monthly basis and is currently meeting virtually due to COVID-19 considerations. Uh, staff attends each and every one of those uh, events that occurs throughout the year. Doing with business, excuse me, doing business with Chariots brochure. This was a brochure that was developed by our procurement and contracts organization to provide information for suppliers on what Chariots is, the different opportunity types available, resource links and contact information. These brochures are distributed at all events and listed in this presentation, as well at the pre-proposal and pre-bid conferences and are available at our business locations in the lobby. A copy of the brochure was included in the materials that, accompany, uh, that accompanied the board packet. And typically that's a trifold. You guys saw it in a uh, um, flat fold, so it, it doesn't really correspond to, to how it works. If you'll bear with me, it actually looks like this and then opens up in a manner that, that follows and people can follow it. SAMTD also uh, participates in, or excuse me, procurement also participates in uh, SAMTD and community events. Our procurement representatives attend these events and provide information and materials to the public. Additionally, we are in the uh, discussions with Oregon Business to present a joint effort with TriMet, LTD, and ODOT focusing on how to do business with transit 
that is tentatively scheduled for the second and third quarter of 2021. This event will be open to all suppliers and we're uh, specifically targeting DBEs. Uh, Chariots and Oregon Business are actually taking the lead in this and we're developing this program so that all agencies involved can include this in their DBE shortfall analysis and provide additional information to the DBE community on how to actually do business with, tra with transit, uh, which is a little different than doing business with other governmental agencies. The Chariots website has specific pages dedicated to doing business with the district. We have a procurement and contracts page. There's a DBE programs page and there's a doing business with chariots page. They all have links to additional resources that include Oregon.gov, USDOT civil rights DBE program, COVID certification website, and the chariot civil rights statement. SAMTD's DBE goal determination methodology is set forth in 49 CFR part 26. It takes into consideration the components identified in this, on, this site, on this slide. Market area, anticipated projects, weight by NAICS code, relative availability of DBEs and weighted base figure. The NAICS code is the North American Industry Classification System other people refer to it as NASICS. Uh, this code is the standard used by federal statistical agencies in classifying business establishments for the purpose of collecting and analyzing statistical data related to the US business economy. These codes allow for focus on companies in similar or identical industries. Companies can have more than one code based upon the products or services that they offer. The district's local market for contracts consists of a geographic area that is defined as the Multnomah County, Washington County, Clackamas County, Yamhill County, Polk County, Marion, Lynn, and Lane counties. This is where a large majority of SAMTD contracting dollars is expended and where a substantial number of the contractors and subcontractors are located and available to submit bids, quotes, and proposals. SAMTD has 12 FTA assisted projects that are anticipated to be awarded during the triennial period and which were considered in preparing this goal methodology. These projects and their federal funds are listed in this table. Column one lists the NAICS code associated with each project. Column two lists the name and brief description of each project. And column three lists the estimated FTA funding for each project. The district reviewed each project anticipated to be awarded in the triennial period and determined the applicable categories of work for each project using the North American Industry Classification System. The corresponding dollar values for each NAICS code for each project were summarized for purposes of weighting the categories of work. This table provides a summary of the categories of work with estimated dollars for each and associated weight. Column one lists the number of projects. Column two lists the category of work by NAICS code. Column three lists the project name and description. Column four lists the estimated funding for each code. And column five lists the estimated percentage of each code. For calculation, we take the estimated FTA dollars for each code divided by the grand total of all estimated funds for the period. In this table, we calculate the relative at availability of DBEs, which is the number of DBEs available as compared to the total firms available for each project. Column one lists the number of projects. Column two lists the category of work by code. Column three lists the project name and description. Column four lists the number of DBEs available to perform work in the market area. These numbers were obtained from the Certification Office for Vision, uh, Business Inclusion and Diversity, the COVID uh, DBE data for, uh, database of certified firms. Column five lists the number of all DBE and non-DBE 
uh, firms available to provide work in the work, excuse me, uh, available to perform the work in the market area. These numbers were obtained from the U.S. Census Bureau County Business Patterns Database and the COVID Database. Column six lists the relative availability of DBEs available to perform the work in this market area. In accordance with the FTA guidance, STA, SAMTD utilized the following formula to derive the relative availability. We derive the number of ready, willing, and able DBE firms identified for each work category by the number of all firms identified within the SAMTD market area for each corresponding work category. That, that arrives at a relative availability. Excuse me. <clears throat> In this table, we cap calculate the weighted base figure of DBEs to arrive at our triennial goal. Column one lists the number of projects. Column two lists the category of work, the NACE code. Column three lists the project name and description. Column four lists the weight by the category of NASIC code from our previous table. Column five lists the relative availability of DBEs from our previous table. And column six lists the weighted base figure. This represents the sum of the DBE availability by NACE code. And the calculation, as you can see on the top of the slide, is weight times availability equals the weighted base figure. And you can see in the total there that we arrive at a, a percentage of 2.49%. This summary represents the general process we used to obtain the sub and submit our three-year DBE goal. So the process steps include developing a goal through the methodology we've discussed, publicly advertise for public comment, analyze the responses obtained through public comment, revise the goal as needed uh, through in accordance with the responses received, finalize the goal, and then submit the final goal to the FTA. So we developed the goal through the methodology we discussed uh, in the previous slides. We publicly advertised for public comment uh, the requirements for, for this uh, uh, goal submittal requires us to advertise our public goal for 30 days. We publicly published the proposed goal from June 22nd to July 22nd to solicit public comment. Uh, we did, so the next process is analyze responses. We did not receive any public comment on our goals. So the next step would have been to revise the goal as needed because we didn't receive any comment, no revision was necessary. We finalized our goal, which became the original goal at 2.49%. And then we submitted our goal to FTA uh, to the FDA. The due date for the goal submittal is generally August 1st of this year. This year due to goal deadline, excuse me, this year the goal deadline was extended to October 1st due to the COVID-19 considerations and SAMTD was ahead of the curve and submitted its goal and rationale to the FTA on August 21st. This concludes the review of our DBE program, background and goal setting methodology. Thank you for your opportunity. For, thank you for the opportunity to provide the information and for your interest in our efforts in this area. And I would love to entertain any questions you have if you're still with me. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions for Manager Canales or Director uh, Dixon? Director Bush. Um, it's just a comment. I can see how um, this process does not apply to the purchasing of the buses like we talked about earlier in the our discussion, or was that in our work session? I'm glassy-eyed, <laughs> but uh, I do understand a little bit now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Davidson and Director Bush. Yes, you're correct. The calculation does not take into consideration transit vehicles purchased. 
I've got uh, a couple questions. I initially, I'm, I'm hoping you could explain. Let's say that I was a, um, I forget a, the classification, but that I might be eligible for uh, being my having my business be a DBE business. What does it take for me to get certified for that kind of thing? I, I, how many hoops are are we or the federal government asking these individuals to jump through? Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So the response to that is that one, they they have to contact the rel relevant agency in each state for which they operate. Um, so in the state of Oregon, they contact uh, the COVID group. Those folks have a set of uh, requirements and information that that, that the DBEs are or the potential DBEs are required to submit, uh, and then they are. They go through a pretty lengthy process. Again, it takes 60 to 90 days to complete. Sometimes it can take longer depending on how long the suppliers take to, to provide the information. Uh, some of the small suppliers are, have a difficult time understanding what information uh, COVID is looking for and asking for, and then finding where in their organization they can actually get it and then supplying it to, them, to COVID for consideration. Uh, COVID actually certifies not only for DBE, they certify for emerging small businesses, for women-owned businesses, uh, for uh, other disadvantaged type businesses. So there's there's five or six categories that COVID actually certifies for. Uh, the, the one we can concern ourselves with is the disadvantaged bus business enterprise. <clears throat> and that is the only, uh, that's the only organization really that they have to get certified through. So it's just one one organization. Once they're certified and they have a letter from the organization certifying them to be a DBE, they get to take advantage of that uh, of that situation. I, I'm very new to this. What is COVID? Is that the agency that makes these determinations? Yes, it's it's a state organization, and it's uh, the Center for Business Inclusion and Diversity. Uh, excuse me, let me get you the, the correct title for it. Uh, we refer to it generally as COVID, so bear with me. I, I, I don't necessarily need to know that. The yeah, exact certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity. Okay, so, so they have control over all the whole state. So if somebody was to get COVID certified, Presumably, they could work with TriMed, Lane Transit, Chariots. It's it's a single statewide. Okay, I'm, I'm tracking yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. We all we all utilize utilize the uh, same requirements. And so the the you know 60 to 90 day process. It sounds like it's pretty intensive of actually getting certified. Do we as Chariots as an entity have any input in potentially accelerating that process or doing outreach to would-be entrepreneurs that could, you know, be a great fit for this. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, in, in short, no, we don't have any influence with COVID. Um, they don't accept any influence from any uh, agency. They, they operate on their own. Uh, however, we do perform outreach and we provide, provide services to small businesses. Uh, at those, uh, the governor's marketplace, the reverse vendor trade shows, <clears throat> at the at the um, Salem Capital Connections, we provide information to those entities on how they can uh, prepare themselves for COVID, and actually, representatives from COVID are are generally at those uh, uh, locations as well, providing information so that so that. The suppliers can prepare for in advance and shorten the, the, the lead time it takes to actually go through the process. Thank you. Uh, and then my, my final question was about the um, process. At, at the end, you mentioned that we had to advertise the proposed goal for 30 days. Where did we place that advertisement? We advert So we're required to advertise that on our website and on, and on our procurement pages. So we, we advertised it in three places. <clears throat> we had a link to it on our website, the, the main website. We advertised it on our procurement page and we advertised it on our DBE goal page. Okay, thank you.
And did, did we do any proactive outreach into, uh, to COVID eligible employers indicating, hey, this is our proposed goal? We did not. We, okay. we um, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat that response by identifying that we did identify it at the Salem Mary Mass Trans, or excuse me, <laughs> the um, Capital Connections meetings. We identified it there and announced it there to the uh, constituents that were in the room and on the uh, virtual meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Director Wynn. Yes, question, um, Mr. Knauss, um, or Knauss, I might have mispronounced your name, I apologize for that. At what point is it a certain size or threshold um, that would fit under the DBE kind of procurement criteria or procurement process versus deviating out of the WISCA contract, the Western States Contracting Alliance? Um, thank you, President Davidson and Director Wynn for the question. So the, the it's, it's not out of the WISCA Alliance. We get our thresholds and, and guidance from FTA and through the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, they are they are agency specific. Our, our thresholds uh, typically we include everything on our small procurements. That means all of our maintenance information, all of our maintenance procurements, uh, anything that's a small to medium sized procurement, which is $10,000 to 250 and as uh, 250 and above that is our large procurement. The only thing that is not included are transit vehicle uh, procurements. So there's not a threshold by that, that, that starts or, or excludes anybody from participating. Uh, we, we actively try to solicit uh, DBE participation in all categories of our procurements. Thank you. Director Bush. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, I was curious, um, I see the, the word ORPIN on the brochure. I printed it off so I could see it better. Um, and it tells a little bit about how that works. I was just curious how, you know, how, how does it work for people? And then do we have um, uh, the brochure in other languages? Because I'm out in the community a lot and I would like to be able to distribute this as I go about Uh, thank you, President Davidson and Director Bush. Um, ORPIN is the Oregon Public Procurement Informa Information Network that's sponsored by the state. Uh, the ORPIN network is where we advertise our solicitations on. Uh, suppliers must get registered on ORPIN. It doesn't cost them anything. Uh, and it's a very easy process to do. Basically, they put in their uh, information and what what type of work they do. and they're qualified um, and, and they get registered. Nobody's turned down from Orpen. Uh, and that provides them an opportunity to see, once we post a solicitation, that solicitation is identified by NAICS codes and by NIGP codes. Anybody that's listed and uh, registered on the Orpen site in those codes will automatically get pushed a notification that those opportunities are out there. Uh, they go to the email address that, that was established in their registration on ORPIN. Um, we also uh, obtain lists of suppliers that our project managers specifically want us to target. Uh, those people are identified on the ORPIN site too and sent a direct notification. Uh, procurement also looks for DBEs. We searched the COVID website for DBEs in those categories. Uh, and then we list all of those and identify those in, as interested parties uh, and COVID or ORPIN actually pushes that information out to each one of those DBEs uh, for our procurement. So they actually will get it pushed to them versus them having to go look for it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot the second part of your question. That's okay. It's getting late. <laughs> I totally understand. I was just asking if you had the information brochure in other languages. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, we posted our notice in other languages. Uh, we have not yet put our brochure in other languages, but we've talked to, talked to our marketing department who puts the brochure together for us. Uh, Stephen Custer is working on that uh, process right now to 
to get one uh, uh, developed so that we can send it out into the communities. And I believe, I believe that's being done in Spanish right now. Uh, I don't know what other languages they are doing it in. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay, I would like, I'd like, I'd like to make one further comment and just to educate the board on um, the other, what the other agency's goals are in our area, uh, just for your education. Please. So as you know, our goal is 2.49% and that's for uh, fiscal years, federal fiscal years, 2021 through 2023. So in, in uh, comparison, LTD, our, our friends down the road, are at 2.9% for 2020 through 2022. That's their triennial period. CTRAN, uh, north of us in Vancouver, is at 2.42% uh, for 2021 through 2023. And then uh, our brother uh, to the north in Portland, TriMet, is at 10.3%. Uh, and that's based on their uh, amount of capital projects that they have going on uh, and the, the amount of DBEs in their in what they call their geographic area. So we, we are pretty consistent in within the similar sized agencies in our area, uh, excluding TriMet, of course, which we would expect to be a little higher. Great. Thank you very much for providing that, that information. Um, Next, uh, that concludes our informational reports. Um, next on our agenda is the general manager's report. So, thank you. So I'll just make a couple of items. First, uh, let me officially welcome Director Hinojos Pressey to the board. Looking forward to uh, your work uh, as we advance public transportation in the region. Uh, also, the last two days, APTA held its uh, Transcend Conference, which is normally their annual meeting uh, uh, but it has gone virtual this year. And so uh, several of us par participated virtually. Also earlier this week, APTA's uh, board of directors met uh, to handle APTA business and I participated in that. Uh, I am uh, continuing to work on the Council of Governments Executive Director Recruitment Panel. Uh, we've completed the first round of interviews and are, are moving on through that process and that's going well. Uh, and. I forget who, but somebody mentioned the Salem, uh, Albany uh, study. Uh, and so uh, we'll give you more information later, but today the Salem, Albany feasibility study open house was held. I, I, I listened in on it. So I know there was only over 50 people participating in that open house. So uh, that's great. And uh, I think they were gathering some good information, but uh, uh, that project is, is moving along nicely. That concludes my report. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. Um, next, we'll move on to the um, Board of Director reports. Um, and for reference, that's page 82 in your board packet. Um, Director Wynn, would you like to provide your report? Yes, so I'd love to. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, with the DEI committee uh, fresh on our minds, uh, it was um, myself and uh, President Davidson and um, Director Inohos Pressey, and uh, along with uh, staff who supported, we convened our very first uh, committee meeting and um, have begun working on appreciations to uh, Director Dixon for preparing the scope of work uh, that we are just now starting to work uh, on ironing out um, the details of uh, the draft um, and we'll be uh, coming back together in three weeks' time to um, uh, finalize the draft. And we, uh, at that point, will uh, move it along to um, get it listed on ORPIN. Um, and we decided to stay away from the end-of-year holiday rush. So uh, it won't be until after the new year. Um, that is what we are shooting for as the goal thanks to the advisement also of the procurement uh, team uh, for many much of the education on the process. I appreciate that. Uh, otherwise, um, not else to, nothing else to report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wayne. Director Bush. Hello. Um, 
There was no citizens advisory committee. It will meet next month according to our schedule. Um, of the three neighborhood associations I participate in, um, the Southeast Kaiser Neighborhood Association did not meet. West Kaiser Neighborhood Association and Greater Gubser Neighborhood Association both had candidate forums and for the Kaiser area, for city council and mayor, and it was very informative. Um, there was not a coffee with Kathy yet. It will be this Saturday, and I, and I in advance thank Patricia Feeney for um, the information she has given to me to share. Um, I listened in on the the mm, the Moac and the Ampak, and I attended three of ODOT's Transit Tuesdays trainings. Very informative, very helpful. Um, on the September 29th was micro mobility. And uh, 1013 was a round table discussion, which I got to hear different leaders of the other transit agencies in the state talk about how they responded to the fires in their area, Lincoln City and Medford in our area, and gave some great insights and kudos to all the people who put their lives on the line to help their communities um, work through all of that. And then on the 20th was the racial justice leadership in action in transit forum. That was also very eye-opening for me. Um, I listened in to our um, the new director being appointed at the legislative sessions. That was exciting. Um, and then I attended the, the Chariots of Salem Albany webinar today. Good information. And, the, and I've been helping with our church's disaster relief efforts. But the one that was really um, impactful for me this month was I attended SEDCOR's um, oh, their seminar on helping to keep your business people engaged during this COVID time of separation. And we're all on high anxiety and, and nervous. We have this fight or flight stuff going on. And I'm just encouraging business people government people, your community, your family, move towards to giving other people purpose and help um, staying connected, even though it seems like everything is trying to keep us apart. Um, initiate activities will help us to do that. Um, communicate, praise, check in on each other. We, um, General Manager Pollock has been giving us some great safety moments in that regard, and this was um, good information to follow up on that. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Director Bush. Director Carney? Hi, can you hear me okay if I speak at this level? We can. Okay, I have a pair of sleeping twins in my lap, so I will keep my report brief. Um, sorry for the camera off, I guess I can, I don't know if you can see me. It's kind of dark in here now. Um, SCATS will meet next week, uh, which is not, it's a little atypical. Normally we meet the same week uh, as a board meeting. So we will meet next week and I will report next month on that policy um, discussion. Uh, and other than that, huge shout out to uh, the DEI committee uplift by directors Wynn and President Davidson and director Inoho Pressey um thank you for taking on that work um and just on a personal note i will say or share that uh at the last moment um our hr department at the department of land conservation and development where i was working found a job rotation for me to start and this week i began a communications position at the department of human services and oregon health authority in their self-sufficiency programs and vocational rehabilitation. Um, so that is exciting, but very busy. And it's a strange time to be onboarding, um, but it's exciting to, to learn about this new and very important body of work that the state is undertaking. So I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, so uh, with that, I will conclude my report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Carney. Uh, I'm next. Um, so for the Mid Willamette Area Commission on Transportation, uh, of note, we received a presentation from um, some students at the University of Oregon, along with staff from Cascade West Council of Governments about the um, 99 West Corridor uh, feasibility study for transit. They were looking at transit 
um, as far ranging as from McMinnville all the way down to South, uh, to Junction City or Eugene. Uh, they looked at three different proposals. It's very preliminary look, um, though uh, there is evidently some interest from the community. There's of course concerns of a such a long distance, whether or not that's one single route or two routes that maybe break up at Corvallis. Anyways, um, it, it sounds like this will be an ongoing project. At least I'm hopeful that it will be. And so um, I'll update you as I learn more. Um, also wanted to say that I think it was last week I had an interview with Salem Reporter um, about a article that's forthcoming uh, about the agency's renewable natural gas and how we're now the, the cleanest public transit agency in the state. So very exciting. Um, and then lastly, wanted to share, and I, I believe um, perhaps it actually hasn't been shared with you, but um, I s submitted a letter to the Salem City Council. Um, they met at this point, I guess it was a couple weeks ago. Um, they were considering some whether or not to adopt specific goals for their climate action plan task force and um, in accordance with our environmental and sustainability um, policies that we had on file, um, which expressly support um, our peer agencies in their work for environmental stewardship. Um, I expressed our support um, for that. And then also as a, a soon to be member on that task force, I indicated uh, that this was going to be an incredibly um, substantive process that it was going to take 17 months and even without with goals very specific goals it was going to be a, a, a hard deliberation so um, ultimately the salem city council uh, selected uh, some goals that will guide the work of the climate action plan task force and then um, just i believe today or yesterday the city indicated that this would impact the our salem planning the comprehensive planning so they're at least partially going back to the drawing board to make sure that these new um, climate action goals are incorporated. This of course impacts us because um, Salem, they're the biggest um, industry or, or, or segment is transportation emissions for their, the, the region's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, one of the ways to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And that of course has a huge impact on planning and how land use is organized. So it, it's great to see that um, the city of Salem is taking this seriously and that they're interested in partnering with chariots on this and taking a, a full comprehensive or at least holistic look at this and not just considering buses, buses exist, we should use buses, but recognizing that there's a whole lot of other pieces that go into this to making it a strong uh, transit system. And with that, that concludes my report. And I skipped over Director Enojos Presi. I'm sorry, I'm so used to going right after Director Carney. Director Enojos Presi, sorry. Well, um, right now, I mean, I'm only really on the the, the DEI committee um, and working on making those connections in my neighborhood association. So I do not currently have much to report. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. We're very happy to have you on board. Um, next is Director Krebs. Uh, well, I had my big activity this month was I attended the OMPOC board meeting. Uh, that's the Oregon Metropolitan Planning Organization Consortium. And uh, it was an online meeting and the highlights were basically we uh, approved a new uh, bylaws update, which basically has the chair and vice chair positions rotating now. There's sort of a, a uh, heir apparent so that when you become vice chair, you're going to move up into the chair position and it's going to rotate uh, through the various MPOs rather than in the past. It was whoever didn't step back fast enough got nominated. Uh, and also to change the name to make it official. Uh, the big issues, uh, we heard the greenhouse gas thing, so there was talk about the Every Mile Counts uh, program which to reduce greenhouse gases and address environmental concerns. Uh, there's also uh, work on a road user fee that would change the type of, uh, there would be extra emphasis for carbon and there would be also higher taxes on vehicles that got 30 miles per gallon or better. 
Uh, and then there was a uh, real round, uh, a uh, round table from the various uh, uh, MPOs. Some of the interesting things, uh, the Lynn Benton Loop has 40 years of uh, history. My cat just decided to visit. And uh, there was a lot of talk about the various bus services in the MPOs. And uh, it was, that's probably it. And uh, so with that, I'll pass it off, pass it back to, you got to meet my cat there. Thank you, Director Cubs. Director Richards? <laughs> this is a nice well, <laughs> With me, uh, I have a lot of connections with uh, civil, you know, the, the people with uh, Northwest Senior Services and with a lot of these different places. And I spent a lot of time getting uh, trailers for other people who didn't have homes anymore. We had quite a quite an experience with that and the other thing was uh we have the food we're on i'm involved with the food section northwest provides you know for for people and we had a very busy time we got a lot of a lot of people who just really didn't have any way to get things that they were so used to getting but but i wish i knew more about the the transportation side but i just a little bit, uh, a little bit low on that yet, but I'm gonna, I'm working hard to get that so that I can help with, with things that deal with, uh, with transportation. Thank you, Director Richards. Um, with that, I believe we're done with our agenda. So thank you very much for hanging in there, everyone. I know this meeting went later than our normal, we normally do. So thank you, and we'll see you next month. We're adjourned.